The bridge was small and modest, a wooden walkway connecting regrets about the past with unknown possibilities of the future. Let me introduce myself as Lyle Jetterman, a 38-year-old man who was once known simply as Gloria's husband and Robert and Anna's father. The emotional family portrait was overshadowed by a heavy financial burden. To support my role as a husband and father, I devoted five years of my life to working for Countryman Realtor. It wasn't my first choice of profession, and it wasn't my passion. My journey began after graduating from law school, just three years after I married Gloria. She was expecting our first child when I threw my graduation cap in the air. Responsibilities weighed heavily on my shoulders, forcing me to make ends meet by any means. The job market for young lawyers didn't look too rosy, but Gloria's pregnancy prompted me to find a job that could provide for my family. I received my first job offer from a law firm that represented banks in closing home loans. It wasn't exactly the job I imagined, but it was a start. While studying law, Gloria worked as a bank operator to help both of us. Her earnings covered the cost of rent and meals, and I worked part-time. Loans and scholarships covered the costs of my education, but I knew I needed to find a way to earn extra money. I decided to make a career in the Ministry of Education in order to provide myself with a stable job for the future. When Gloria unexpectedly became pregnant around the time I was graduating from law school, I accepted the job offer without hesitation. This was just the beginning of the many compromises I made to adjust to the responsibilities of married life. Looking back, I understand that in the past, banks provided financial assistance to individual home buyers who wanted to purchase it. It was a different time, and in order to support our growing family, it was necessary to find additional sources of income. As a lawyer, I had to represent the interests of the lender bank during the closing of mortgage transactions. Sitting at the table in the house, I facilitated the transaction. For my help, the buyer paid the bank a commission of about $500. In addition, the law firm received another $500 from the insurance company. Every time we completed a deal, it meant a solid income of $1,000. Although the company also profited from these transactions, it was a profitable venture for all involved. I received only a small part of my salary. I believed that eventually all the positive things would stop, and true thrift would give way to negativity and outright greed. Shortly after my wife Gloria gave birth to our second child, the smaller banks were absorbed by the larger ones, which were then absorbed by even larger banks. Personal loans for retail purposes have gone down in history. The rapidly changing environment and the need to meet deadlines undermined my mental and physical health. Sitting at my desk, surrounded by paperwork and the constant hum of the office, I couldn't shake the feeling of disappointment. The once noble legal profession has turned into a transactional business where profit prevails over ethics and human relations. I longed for a change, a return to a time when my work was meaningful and influential. I wanted to break out of the soul-sucking routine of corporate law and rediscover my passion for justice and protection of interests. And so I made the difficult decision to leave a comfortable and safe job in search of something more fulfilling. It was a leap of faith, but I knew it was necessary for my own well-being and happiness. The last time I left the office, I felt a mixture of relief and excitement. The future was uncertain, but I knew that I had taken a step towards regaining my passion and purpose in life. I have achieved my current position through hard work and dedication. Each closure earns me $75, and I am happy with my income, especially considering that I close seven to eight loans daily, five to six days a week. But I can't help but wonder how sustainable such a pace is in the long run. A feeling of foreboding is coming at me. It was at this moment that Bernard Schiffer, or Bernie, as he prefers to be addressed, found in me a witty and capable person. Bernie's company, Countryman Real Estate, needed a lawyer with a law degree to join the team. The main owner of the contract was soon leaving for the Sun Belt, which gave Bernie the opportunity to expand his business. Countryman Real Estate owned a stake in the Scarlet Woods project, 
which included 100 approved plots with plans for another 400. The complex was strategically located two miles from the Techno Park, which housed an international foundry, where it was planned to create 2,000 high-tech jobs. Bernie was happy to take this opportunity and was ready to take his company to the next level. Schiffer was a builder and developer, was able to find financing for ambitious projects, but did not have sales skills for small businesses. While he could easily offer a million-dollar idea to a banker, it was difficult for him to sell a simple stone countertop to a homeowner or explain to a potential buyer the benefits of a variable-rate mortgage. Surprisingly, our collaboration turned out to be organic. I succeeded in selling houses and working with small details, which perfectly complemented Bernie's strengths. The focus was on processing rustling paper documents for delivery. I gained knowledge about profit centers from past employers by increasing Bernie's sales through various channels such as home insurance agents, movers, and gardeners. This is how we turned into a comprehensive agency with a clear goal, to increase home sales and maximize profits from every aspect of the transaction. Bernie wasted no time getting started on construction projects, and I diligently managed operations in the office. Bernie handled the big deals, and I handled the small ones. He was hitting the jackpot, and I was enjoying a comfortable salary as his employee. He was well aware that trouble was looming on the horizon. Bear Stearns was just the beginning of the financial crisis. When Lehman Brothers collapsed, it became clear that the worst was yet to come. Despite the chaos, Bernie remained optimistic. He knew that what goes up must go down, but he believed in the durability of real estate. If we can carefully weather this storm, we will come out of it stronger. We were ready for the upcoming significant growth. Bernie was confident that the market would recover, so he worked hard to maximize our profits. With the money he earned, he improved our suburban real estate. But Bernie felt limited by our current success and wanted to discover more opportunities for himself. One evening, over drinks, he announced his decision, saying that he had sold everything. Shocked, I asked him to explain what we were going to do next and tried my best to stay calm. The new owner did not plan any changes. Bernie's prediction turned out to be correct again. When I met Gabe Zello, I immediately noticed his youthful appearance. In his early 30s, he successfully acquired Bernie's business. Being taller and younger than me, Gabe was the epitome of a business superstar prodigy with his beautiful, blonde, Adonis-like features. Although I was tempted to envy his success, Gabe's charm and friendliness did not allow me to hold a grudge against him. Working with Bernie brought positive emotions. At almost 50 years old, Bernie was single-minded, but at the same time, cautious. On the other hand, Gabe was more open and willing to take risks. He always put everything on display. From the very beginning, it became clear that Gabe's purchase of suburban real estate had a negative impact on his finances. Gabe was more focused on finance than construction and preferred to manage rather than sell. He was eager to make a quick buck, especially when the real estate market was booming. Bernie's decision to invest money in a compatriot turned out to be wise. He was on his way to Florida to take part in a major real estate deal at one of the casinos. On the eve of departure, he invited me to join him, but I refused, citing my duties as a husband and father. Bernie warned me that I might regret my decision. I hoped he was wrong, but I checked the job market anyway, realizing that there wasn't much left in my old company. One of the junior partners managed to survive during the fall of the company. He was grateful to have a job, but the salary was only a third of what he had earned before. Despite this, he worked hard to keep the business afloat. Working for Gabe, as we affectionately called him, was generally positive. He treated me well and allowed me to manage the office on a daily basis. Although I had some doubts about him, my only small complaint was that Bernie never hosted official Christmas parties. But Gabe spared no expense, and I booked one of the best places to stay in Saratoga, albeit out of season, but at a high price. The party, held on the first Saturday of December, was attended by employees, contractors, bankers, and realtors. 
It was a lavish party with a lot of guests, and Gabe, who paid the bill, was in charge. Although there may have been a good business reason for this extravagant event, my discontent began to show around midnight and only intensified as the night went on. I entered the room, and the most attractive woman was next to me. Gloria and I tied the knot shortly after graduating from college. We were both only 22 years old. She took a low-paying job to provide for us while I was getting my law degree. I will always appreciate her sacrifices, even though she decided to stop taking contraceptives herself, which led to her pregnancy. Surprisingly, this unplanned event turned out to be a blessing in disguise, as it coincided with my preparation for the bar exam. We have become great parents, and we continue to be. When I was struggling to find a place to rent, she was always there for me. Gloria devoted herself to family and education, combining the upbringing of our children with working night shifts to get a doctorate in child psychology. As soon as our youngest child started school, Gloria resumed her career and got a job at the State Department. At this time, she also began what I now call my running journey. Despite being considered plump by some standards, Gloria was determined to improve her health and fitness. At the age of 30, she switched from swimming in the pool a couple of times a week and running with our children to independent long-distance running. This was the beginning of her newfound passion for running. Every morning, my wife got up early to walk five miles through the countryside. In the evenings, she devoted half an hour to intense sprints. Her speed was incomparable to any runner in the area, and only applicants for national awards managed to surpass her in local races by 10 and 20 miles. She even competed in the New York City Marathon three times, consistently getting into the top 100 women. As for me, I am far from a homebody. I try to go to the gym at least three times a week, and on summer weekends I enjoy cycling as much as 20 miles. Perhaps the percentage of fat in my body does not exceed 5%, and my physique does not resemble a Michelangelo masterpiece, but I wholeheartedly supported Gloria in her quest. I witnessed her dedication when she got up before dawn to exercise and came home sweating when I woke the kids. I was very proud of my wife. When we entered the Christmas party together, and Gloria was next to me. There was silence in the room, and all eyes turned to her to admire her amazing figure. In high heels, Gloria was perfect for my height. Her hair cascaded down her back, framing her face like a veil. When she moved, she tied them in a ponytail, attracting the admiring glances of those who stood behind her. That evening, they sparkled in the light of the ballroom lights when Gloria went to the party. Dressed in an elegant black dress with scallop trim, she revealed a hint of cleavage and flaunted her toned legs thanks to the immodestly short hemline. The dress emphasized her flat stomach and well-defined figure, so all eyes were on her when she entered the hall. She was a muse of passionate creativity. My wife shed her former plumpness and turned into an amazing woman in my arms. Gabe quickly greeted us and took Gloria to the dance floor. Although I couldn't deny that they made a great couple, he towered over me in both height and strength. His undisguised admiration for her turned into inappropriate behavior. As the clock approached midnight, he kissed her audaciously. I did not feel jealous, knowing about the attractiveness of my wife, but I was unshakably confident in her loyalty. We have overcome many difficulties together. From studying at law school, raising children, and paying off student loans to illnesses and miscarriages. I feel sorry for those couples who have never faced difficulties together. I truly believe that it is difficult times that strengthen a marriage and make a couple closer. Gloria and I have been through it all together, supporting and loving each other at every turn. But today I noticed that Gloria's behavior has changed. She began to indulge in alcohol and enjoy the attention of others. I brushed it off, thinking it was just a one-time occurrence. Without further conversation, I gently escorted my wife home, silently realizing that sometimes actions speak louder than words. I pretended that everything was fine. Gloria had just had too much to drink, I reassured myself. Another six months have passed and Memorial Day weekend has arrived. In the first half of the year, the real estate market was booming. 
the number of buyers has increased dramatically. The last week of May brought record heat. The company's bank account was overflowing with proceeds from recent home sales, ready to be credited on the first day of June. After the three-day weekend, we plan to review and process the receipts electronically as soon as the office opens. Will you join us at camp this weekend? Gabe asked. Gabe was thrilled. He had rented a cabin in the mountains in the Adirondacks for Memorial Day weekend and had been talking about it nonstop for weeks. Although his invitation was addressed to both Gloria and me, I hesitated to take part in it. I'm not sure about Gloria's plans, I replied, trying to refuse. Gabe calmed me down. I am sure that Gloria will come with us and I will be very happy about it. I looked at him with a puzzled expression on my face. Gabe quickly mentioned that he had spoken to Gloria on the phone. Why was it so hard for me to trust him? After he left, I called Gloria and confirmed that she was delighted. It seemed like this was my last chance to prevent a disaster. Unfortunately, I couldn't recognize it. I had deep feelings for Gloria and believed in her. According to MapQuest, the trip to Gabe's house won't be easy. At the rental point, I swapped my Honda Accord for an all-wheel drive SUV. According to the map, the last leg of the journey consisted of 20 miles of winding mountain roads, followed by three miles of dirt roads. I had been in the difficult Adirondack Mountains before, so I was familiar with their rugged terrain. Gabe's house was southwest of Saranac Lake, and it took almost four hours to get to his destination. The GPS only gave directions for the last five miles of the journey. After leaving the freeway, we drove the last two miles along a partially paved road, which eventually led us to a wooden bridge. A narrow bridge spanning a deep ravine in the Adirondack Mountains looks solid after recent repairs. Such rugged terrain is typical of this wild region. As I carefully made my way across the bridge, I couldn't get rid of the feeling that I was trapped, like a mouse in a maze where a cat is hiding. Despite the fact that I was using GPS, there didn't seem to be an alternative route. After driving three miles along a bumpy dirt road, we arrived at a picturesque two-story house nestled in a clearing on the mountainside, about a thousand feet below the summit. The windows offered stunning views of a dozen Adirondack peaks to the north, and we found ourselves in a secluded area where a charming country house had been built. I parked the SUV in an untouched parking lot next to three other high-end cars, all of them immaculately maintained. There was a sense of novelty and careful attention to detail from the surroundings. The house exuded the modern charm of a rustic style. Traditional log walls and a cozy interior decorated in a combination of old and new. It looked like a modern mountain lodge disguised as a 19th century retreat. The attention to detail was amazing, and it was obvious that Gabe had done his best to create this illusion. It was obvious that he was trying to impress someone, and it definitely wasn't me. When we were invited to the spacious veranda with armchairs and charming decor, I noticed that six people were waiting for us. Gabe and his two college buddies, Ken Lewis and Glenn Sachs, were in their early 20s. Ken, the shortest of them, was tall and had a muscular build like a weightlifter. Despite his incipient baldness and not as handsome a face as Gabe's, his tight t-shirt and shorts showed off impressive musculature. Glenn, another college buddy, was about six feet tall with curly blonde hair, which made him more attractive compared to Ken. Glenn hugged Sharon tightly, a stunning blonde with curves in all the right places. Standing next to Ken was Robin, a perky brunette in her thirties who was clearly his date. Despite her petite build, her large breasts seemed almost out of proportion. Last in the group was a statuesque woman with flowing brown hair. Paula Henry was one of those who can be called beautiful. Her striking facial features were both alluring and domineering, radiating intelligence. It was obvious that she was aware of her attractiveness, and this could not but please others. Despite her undeniable attractiveness, there was a sharpness in her features that set her apart from more traditionally feminine women. Paula was clearly the youngest in the group, a former school friend of the boys. When everyone gathered to celebrate the successful journey, 
the atmosphere was filled with an overwhelming sense of joy and camaraderie. But there was something unusual about the way they greeted Paula. Gabe greeted my wife warmly, gave me a quick nod, and his girlfriend Paula gave me a disdainful look, as if I were a model to study. They organized dinner for us, and we hurriedly carried the bag to the room assigned to us on the second floor. Our cozy room was adjacent to Gabe's master suite. We all gathered in the large hall, a spacious room that served as a living room, dining room, and game room. Gathered around a massive oak table, we enjoyed fancy dishes from the microwave. The food was delicious, but it lacked a personal touch, and of course it was expensive. The wine flowed freely, and our glasses were constantly replenished by the generous host. When we sat by the gas fireplace on the terrace after dinner, strong cocktails were served. It was obvious that this weekend would be filled with copious booze. I began to analyze my circumstances, asking thoughtful questions and paying close attention to the details. At first glance, it seemed like I was just spending an ordinary holiday weekend with my boss, two of his friends and their girlfriends. But on closer inspection, it turned out that everything is much more complicated. It soon became clear that Robin has a fiancé elsewhere, and Sharon is actually married, has two children, and her husband is waiting for her at home. To make matters even more complicated, Sharon and Robin were work colleagues. The group allegedly had a great weekend at the girls' only spa. Cheating was treated lightly and with jokes. Paula seemed to pull away from the others, focusing on me and not really communicating with the group. Despite the fact that Gabe was openly flirting with my wife, Paula didn't look worried and sat between him and Gloria for most of the evening. Gabe mostly talked to Gloria throughout the evening. Despite my attempts to communicate with Paula, she showed only polite interest and subtly hinted to me to leave her alone. In the late afternoon, the lively guests seemed ready to end the evening, but there was still an atmosphere of anticipation in the room. Out of the blue, Gabe spoke up and suggested that I must be tired from the trip. My wife Gloria supported him by suggesting that I go to bed and she will join me later. I'm not going to bed until I've had another drink, I said, grabbing the bottle. Unless you want to, Gabe, I added. I forced myself to smile, but inside I was seething with the audacity of this man trying to seduce my wife. I couldn't help but doubt the intentions of Gloria, who spent the whole evening with him, just like at the Christmas party. Had she really fallen in love? Did my wife fall in love with my boss? This evening turned into a tense waiting game, but in the end, I came out of it victorious. After a while, Gloria finally joined me in the bedroom. As soon as we were in the room assigned to us, Gloria decided to take a shower alone. I didn't try to join her as it seemed inappropriate. She seemed distant towards me and I felt insecure. When Gloria finished taking a shower, I hurried to rinse off. I assumed she would be in bed by the time I was done, but to my surprise, she was sitting naked on the edge of the bed. Please, she said, patting the seat next to her. When I sat down, she turned to me and spoke. I expect to have a great weekend. Life has been difficult, but I've put in a lot of effort and I think I need a break, Gloria said coldly. I have no complaints. You've been a wonderful wife and mother in difficult times. You supported me during law school and raised our children on my limited income while I continued my education. You have worked hard to maintain your incredible physique, and you continue to do more than you should in our house. I'm proud to be married to you, I said proudly. Nodding at me, Gloria got into bed, and so did I, instantly passing out. The morning light coming through the open blinds of the large bedroom window woke me from my nap. Gloria usually woke up by the time I went out for a morning run, but under the influence of a lot of alcohol the night before, I overslept. I got out of bed, closed the curtains, and went to the small bathroom with a shower. Although the bedroom was of modest size, it was well equipped with all the necessary amenities. After showering and shaving, I headed downstairs before anyone else woke up. While no one has yet woken up from sleep, I decided to explore the surroundings. Moving from the spacious living room, I went out onto the terrace, 
decorated with a bonfire and a comfortable built-in barbecue. Beyond the courtyard was a raised terrace with a charming swimming pool and sauna. Despite the coolness of the spring air and the unforgiving mountains, I was pleasantly surprised to find that the entire area is heated. Going up to the terrace, I noticed a lot of solar panels decorating the slopes of the mountain and providing a luxurious complex with sustainable energy. Walking along the terrace, I noticed that the pool was warm, as was probably the whole house. When I reached the modest-looking barn, I found it crammed with ATVs, snowmobiles, and gardening tools, as well as several compact tractors. Passing by the barn, I heard the gentle murmur of a nearby stream. The stream flowed behind a closed barn with a small pipe sticking out of the roof, about 20 yards away from me. Looking out the tiny window, I saw a generator and several fuel tanks, which carefully stored gasoline for sports cars and emergency power. It was obvious that in this isolated world, someone had thought through every detail, preparing for any situation that might arise. There was a small shallow stream nearby which seemed too insignificant for the fish, until I saw one of them jump out of the water. Are you fishing? A voice suddenly asked from behind me. I was caught off guard when I heard a voice behind me, and when I turned around, I saw that it was Paula. No, I replied. And I fished when I was younger and had more free time, she said with a touch of nostalgia. Well, there's nothing to be ashamed of. However, you can catch up this weekend, I said. I laughed at her remark that she didn't have time to go fishing, knowing full well that she was just as busy as I was. How about we have breakfast and take a walk up the mountain? I suggested. Paula hesitated for a moment before replying, In my opinion, it's a waste of time to come all this way and not climb to the top. Then she busied herself making coffee in a stainless steel coffee maker. The kitchen pantry was full of options for a quick and light breakfast, perfect for a busy morning. My companion and I chose instant oatmeal, as we noticed that no one in the house had woken up yet. It looks like they all slept late. And now I don't mind going for a walk, Paula offered, smiling. Paula seemed to know exactly where the trail began and confidently led us in the right direction. The top was just around the corner, but after an hour of walking it seemed as far away as it had been at the beginning of the journey. Are you sure you want to continue climbing? I asked, feeling unsure. Did you give up so quickly, old man? She asked. I can't help but wonder what the others will say when they realize we're not with them, I replied. Paula giggled. Don't worry, I highly doubt they'll even notice our absence. When we reached the top, the sun was high in the sky, which indicated that it was almost noon. The view from the top of the mountain was not impressive. A flat area with rounded edges. Two weathered wooden benches faced east, towards the gatehouse. There were several peaks to the south and east, but the distant views were obscured by fog. Despite the fresh and clean air, there was a cool breeze at noon, which was not unpleasant at all. My companion decided to sit down and enjoy the view, asking if I minded. I would like to rest before going down, she said. No problem, the old man needs to rest too, I replied smiling. Then our conversation turned to the company in the house, where it turned out that Glenn was a broker and Ken was a banker. We talked all night, but I still haven't figured out who you are by profession, I said. Paula looked at me as if weighing the possible consequences of disclosing information about her work. I'm an inspector. I work for the government. It's not the most interesting and highly paid job, she admitted. I asked if she had checked on anyone we knew. Not lately. Back in college, it seemed to me that I was constantly helping my friends, she replied. They were constantly on edge, whether it was defending themselves from an angry partner or retaking exam answers. It was just part of their nature. These exceptional individuals have always lived on the edge, Paula said with a shrug. So it's your responsibility now? Are you protecting them? I asked. Well, what's the point of closing the stable door if the horse has already run away? It won't bring back what was lost. The rules can be restrictive, 
It is more profitable for the smart to lead and for the rest to stay behind, Paula replied. The most important thing is that in the end, everyone gets rewarded for their efforts, she added. So what are your plans for the weekend? It looks like you didn't have much fun at last night's party, I said. She paused, seemingly taken aback by the question. I got up and walked to the edge where I could see a path descending from the mountain. There was only one way left, the only means of salvation. I turned to face the field. Did she think about it like the others? In a moment of sudden gestalt, I realized that they were completely oblivious to anything other than their own physical desires. But were they really blind to all this? Paula was obviously an observer. She should have been as aware of the problem as I was. I'm just present as a sober person, making sure that everything goes smoothly and there are no violations. Any issues are quickly resolved. I prefer not to interfere unless it is required. Unless, of course, the Golden Boys call me, Paula said. I may not agree with this point of view, but I can understand what is behind it and what will ultimately be most beneficial for everyone in the long run, Paula said. Shall we go downstairs? I asked. The way back will be faster, Paula agreed. Yes, it's faster, but the descent is steep and potentially dangerous. You may fall, I warned. Why take the risk if we're already at the top? She objected, but still got up and started the descent. We reached the hut without incident, but my fears only increased. We found the remaining group by the pool. My eyes widened at the sight of my wife in an elegant black bikini that I had never seen her in before. The revealing outfit left no room for imagination, showing off her stunning figure. The other women in the group were dressed more modestly. As Paula and I approached, I saw my wife sitting on Gabe's lap and kissing passionately. Paula's loud greeting startled them, causing my wife and Gabe to quickly disperse. Judging by Gabe's mischievous grin, he felt like a guilty child caught red-handed and confident that no consequences would follow. My wife's grin seemed exaggerated and insincere to me. Hi, where have you been? She asked, as if addressing a casual acquaintance. There was a tense silence before Paula took my hand. Well, we obviously missed lunch, and after climbing the mountain we deserved a meal, she said, leading me to the hut. I heard muffled laughter as we walked away from the pool, not knowing what Paula had prepared for us. Paula handed me a glass of black Johnny Walker, which went down my throat like fire. Think before you do anything, she advised. It's just one weekend in a strong marriage, you have to think about your family, Paula added. When we returned to the pool, the other couples were already enjoying the jacuzzi. Men were laughing, women were giggling. I noticed that my wife was still sitting on Gabe's lap. I couldn't see their hands underwater, but I assumed they were busy with each other. Paula found a place where she could watch what was happening and sat down between me and the jacuzzi. I pretended that I wanted to have another drink, but in the end, I justified myself and left. Away from prying eyes, I poured out the contents of my glass, feeling a strange mixture of jealousy and excitement. I was proud of my wife, but at the same time I couldn't help but feel disappointed. My wife devoted herself to turning from the chubby girl I married into a beautiful athletic woman who was now coveted by right. I felt a sense of pride knowing that men were attracted to her strong and loving hugs, but I couldn't help but wonder what had become of her soul during this physical transformation. Watching her with Gabe was strange. The image of their perfect bodies entwined in intimacy was both frightening and enticing. I walked around the house, carefully studying its internal structure, and passed the time thinking about the direction in which events were developing. I knew that in the end, I would have to make the choice myself. I entered our bedroom, deciding to try to fall asleep. As I lay there trying to calm my mind, I was haunted by thoughts about why my wife was flirting and kissing another man. We have been through many trials together, including the fight against poverty at an early age. Our children suffered from various illnesses, and we were constantly under strain trying to make ends meet within the budget of the middle class. Despite all these difficulties, 
we have finally begun to see some progress towards a safe and comfortable life. The children were old enough to take care of themselves. My wife had a decent career, and I finally started earning well after years of financial struggle. Our debts were under control, and our future looked promising. So why did we have to give it all up for someone as shallow and narcissistic as Gabe? There was no substance behind the charm and self-confidence. If you remove the attractive facade, there will be nothing valuable under it. Gabe never developed a site plan, built houses, or sold real estate. He was just holding a position in a company run by others, a rich man born into a privileged position. He was nothing more than a self-made image. What was Gloria thinking about when she got into a relationship with him? She claimed that she wanted to have a fun weekend, but would it really be fun and how would it end up? I fell asleep quickly, and when I went downstairs, everyone was already gathered in a spacious room. It looked like lunchtime had already passed, as the drinks were still being poured. Gloria was sitting on Gabe's lap again, and their previous kiss was impossible to miss. All the women, including Paula, took off their bikinis, and it seems that Ken and Robin shared the floor. Ignoring this scene, I headed to the kitchen in search of food. When I was warming up dinner in the microwave, Gloria came into the room. How are you? she asked. It could have been better, I replied. I hesitated for a moment before she spoke again. I spent the evening with Gabe, she confessed. That's what I thought, I remarked when the microwave beeped. When I turned to check the food, she smiled strangely. No, I mean the evening in his room, she clarified. I said nothing, turning away from her. It was very important that she did not realize how much pain she was causing me at that moment. I understand, but what about our 16 years of marriage? I asked. That's why I can do it. It's just for the weekend. Next week I will be completely yours again, she assured me. Do you think Gabe will have any problems with that? I asked. Gloria hugged me from behind and pressed her head against my back. Gabe likes you. He mentioned that you have plans. It's just a short fling, a little weekend fun, Gloria explained. Do I have the right to vote? I asked as she hugged me tightly. Not really. It's already been decided, Gloria replied, released me and left the kitchen. I followed her into a large room, where they were already climbing the stairs. Gabe looked around, smiled at me, and gave me a thumbs up, as if we were keeping some secret together. He whispered something in Gloria's ear as they disappeared down the stairs. Gloria waved and smiled at me before I turned back to the kitchen. It was obvious that everything we had been through meant nothing to her. My wife left me, leaving me in a humiliated state. In frustration, I threw the food out of the microwave and decided to make coffee instead. It was going to be a long night. When the water boiled, I heard someone enter the kitchen. Turning around, I saw Paula watching me. I didn't expect you to make coffee. Wouldn't it be better to drink something instead? She asked. I just answered, to each his own. I asked, what is your role here? Paula answered with a shrug. I'm here to help and maintain a sense of calm. I asked, how are you going to achieve this? She jokingly replied, by sleeping with me. I rejected the idea, but it reassured me. Don't worry, I won't go that far. You will be reunited with your wife and may receive a bonus. I asked, so there's a financial incentive. She confirmed it. Isn't that always the case? Working for this person, you will not be able to create a scandal. First of all, think about your family. All you can do is accept what comes to you. This is their reality, not yours. It's just the way the circumstances turned out, Paula advised. A joyful exclamation came from above. She seems to be having a great time, Paula smiled. Well, that's great. A fun weekend for everyone in the mountains. These rocks have stood the test of time. Our presence is only a fleeting moment for them. Thousands of years ago, they were buried under layers of ice. I said sarcastically. Overcoming the obstacles that stand in our way, we must remember the fragile balance on which our world rests. One small violation can lead to its collapse, showing the fragility of our existence. 
At such moments, we see through illusions that cloud our perception. I finished my dialogue. Paula giggled at the realization. You're not a bad philosopher, she said. Not really, I replied. I'm just someone who understands how important it is to distinguish reality from illusion. Paula apparently decided that I wouldn't bother and left me alone with my coffee and my pain. About one o'clock in the morning, I went up the stairs. As I passed the bedroom, I couldn't help but hear loud screams and moans of pleasure coming from my wife. She was always quiet during our intimate moments, but it seems Gabe revealed a different side of her. Younger and more resilient, he turned out to be an excellent lover in every way. It was obvious that in his arms, my wife had found the pleasure she was looking for. After taking a shower, I quickly changed into the most comfortable clothes to prepare for the cold weather outside. Despite the noise coming through the walls, I tried to focus on the task at hand and waited patiently. It was only at three o'clock in the morning that silence reigned in the house. After waiting another half hour, I decided to go downstairs. Rummaging through the kitchen cabinet, I found a flashlight and candles with matches. It was a precaution in case of an unexpected power outage, a harsh reality that I wanted to be prepared for. When I went outside, I was greeted by the pitch-black darkness of the night. The moon disappeared from the sky, leaving the mountains in the eerie sounds of the night. For a person accustomed to the constant noise of the city, the silence of the wilderness seemed deafening. Despite the darkness, I found the shed without difficulty, where I found a large plastic canister filled with gasoline for motorsport and a wrench. The shed with the generator was padlocked, but the rusty hinge easily yielded to the key. The owners of the house thoughtfully installed a hand pump for gasoline intake, and I easily refueled for further travel. In just 10 minutes, the canister was already filled with gasoline. After walking around the house for a while, I headed to the place where my rented SUV was parked. After loading the gasoline canister into the trunk, I turned off the handbrake and switched the transmission to drive. After giving the car a ride on the road, I waited until it was a decent distance away and only then started the engine and set off. When I reached the bridge, I moved cautiously along it. I drove out onto the gravel road and continued on my way. I stopped to make sure that the gasoline had thoroughly soaked into the wooden planks of the bridge. The structure was sturdy and skillfully made, which testified to the skill of its builders. It was evident that the careful work of experienced craftsmen on every detail was used in its construction. This bridge, built by real people, was created for the pleasure of those who relied on someone else's work in their spare time. With a wave of my hand, I dropped the match onto the gasoline-soaked wood. The match caught fire with a hiss, and the flame shot up into the air. When the fire grew, I quickly retreated, leaving a burning bridge behind me. There was a deafening explosion of heat and flame, from which the wooden bridge caught fire with a loud crack. The flames could be seen for miles. Calming down, I returned to the car and drove slowly away, realizing that there was no need to hurry. Those who witnessed the chaos now found themselves on the other side, not realizing what position they were in. I was sure that I would be able to leave before they realized that they were trapped. At the first light of dawn, I stopped at a gas station located off the highway. After refueling my SUV, I left the empty canister at the pumps, deciding that someone would eventually take it away. I got out of the SUV at 9 in the morning and picked up my car. After showering and getting dressed for work, I had to do a couple more things to complete my departure from Countryman Real Estate. Bernie, my forgetful but kind boss, often contacted me to return the things he left in the office. Having the keys to all the doors and filing cabinets, I was always ready to help. Gabe was known for his meticulousness in the organization of the office and personal belongings. His spacious mahogany desk even had a built-in safe for added security. But Gabe made a serious mistake by saving the combination from the safe in a folder marked Security. This folder was kept in a locked closet, but I was able to access it because Bernie gave me the key. Twenty minutes after I entered Gabe's office, 
I managed to get the diary with the password out of his safe. I could have easily stolen everything and left, but that wasn't part of my plans. I knew that stealing would only lead to imprisonment. Instead, I decided to transfer the transaction account to another account. When I first joined Countryman, we opened a trust account for deposits. With each new project, a new trust account was created to meet the requirements of the state. The original trust account remained intact and was eventually forgotten. The previous account was documented in archives but not in books. It remained empty until I put almost 20 million on it. To ensure our financial security, I transferred all the cash we had to him and increased the credit line as a precaution. Although my actions may seem purely symbolic, rest assured that nothing was taken illegally. Everything was taken into account and was in its place, but it will take several days to find and return the funds. By early Tuesday morning, electronic money transfers will be credited to a previously empty operating account. Numerous payments have to be cancelled, which causes uncertainty about the extent of the damage suffered. Our dependence on loans means that we constantly owe banks more money than we have. Without access to credit, hard times await us, albeit temporary ones. Citizens will have to make additional efforts to restore their credit history. The longer the financial crisis continues, the more significant this problem will become. I hope Gabe stays in the mountains until Tuesday. I decided to leave as soon as everything was settled, and the next step would be to print and hand in my resignation letter. Just as I was about to leave the office and put the letter on Gabe's secretary's desk, my cell phone rang. Glancing at the screen, I saw a picture of Gloria, but I chose to ignore the call. But shortly after that, a voicemail notification came, and I couldn't resist listening to it. In the message, Gloria expressed concern about the missing car and asked where I was, demonstrating her concern. Could you call me back? My wife asked in the message. About 30 minutes later, the phone rang again. It was Gabe. Hi, Lyle. How are you? Gloria is very worried. You should call her right now. There was a hint of threat in his tone, but it only made me smile. By Sunday, Gloria had called three more times, and Gabe had called twice, and the second call was more insistent and demanded that I call him back. On Monday morning, I went to pick up the children from Gloria's parents. When I was about to leave, Gloria called me again. Laylee, I'll be back tonight. We really need to talk. Please call me if you receive this message. I'm very worried, she said. At first it seemed childish to me, and I doubted that she would really come back. But when I got to her parents' house, they had already gathered and were anxiously waiting for me. Gloria called and said you can pick up the kids yourself, her mother informed me. You should call her, her father added. She said she would be back in the evening, the mother added. I wanted to argue as little as possible with my family members, Although they were unhappy with the current situation, there was little they could do. My daughter felt that something was wrong, but I assured her that it was our mother's business. I suggested waiting for her to return to discuss everything in more detail. After settling the children at home, I went to our old bedroom and contacted Felix Rodriguez. Hi, Lyle. How are you? Not really, Felix. I need your help, I replied. Felix was the most experienced family lawyer I've ever come across. He has succeeded both professionally and personally. What's going on? What's the matter? He asked. I need to start the divorce process. Gloria is having an affair with Gabriel Zello. You know, this is my boss, I said. Oh no, I'm really sorry to hear that, Felix replied. What steps should I take? I asked. Felix and I spent an hour on the phone talking about the situation. I made an appointment for late Tuesday evening to start the process. Gloria kept calling, and her parents sent conciliatory messages. Gloria and Gabe took turns leaving messages on the phone. There is no threat anymore. If I made a mistake, I apologize. I don't want the events of this weekend to affect our professional relationship. It's not going to benefit any of the participants if you know what I mean, Gabe said. Lyle, Lyle, please call. Something happened here. There is no bridge. We're all trapped. Call me, I need to talk to you. 
his wife wrote later in the message. The following Tuesday morning, I called my old partner, Stephen Pender. We decided to meet for lunch at a modest diner in one of the shopping malls. Are you sure about this? Stephen asked, taking a bite of his tuna sandwich. I have officially resigned, I said firmly. Almost immediately, my former secretary Donna called from Countryman. Lyle, they say you quit, but we need you to come back. Everything is falling apart here. Something is seriously wrong, she pleaded. I'm really sorry, Donna. I'm not part of the team anymore. Try contacting Gabe. I heard that he was stuck in the mountains because of problems with the bridge, I replied. I am very sorry to hear that, but don't worry. I'm sure everything will be fine in the end. Is there anything I should know about? Steve asked. No, I don't care anymore, I replied. Well, if you're sure, I think I can increase my previous offer by 10000 a year. If you can get to work immediately, Steve said. Isn't it too early tomorrow? I asked, laughing. No, that would be perfect, Steve replied. And so on Wednesday morning, I started my new job at Pandora and Partners. On Wednesday afternoon, just as I was starting to relax, I was interrupted by a visitor. Where's my money? Gabe Zelo demanded. Confused, I asked, what kind of money do you mean? Operating funds. Don't play dumb. I'll sue you for embezzlement if you don't give them to me, Gabe said. I calmly suggested that he talk to the company's accountant, forcing him to think about how to get out of a difficult situation without having the necessary funds. You may consider yourself a knowledgeable lawyer, but in reality, you're just a jerk who can't please his own wife. She enjoyed spending time with me, and I will continue to pay attention to her whenever I want, Gabe said before leaving. The next day, the authorities contacted me. They demanded that I come to the station for questioning. Unfortunately, I have just started a new job, and my schedule is very tight. Nevertheless, I am ready to respond to your requests in writing and will call you later, I said. The officer who called tried to explain that they did not deal with such matters, but I immediately stated that I was a lawyer and clarified that I worked exclusively with written documents. After a short correspondence, the conversation ended abruptly. I realized that the police would need to confirm the theft charge by tracing the money which would probably lead them to the company account to which I had recently transferred them. As soon as this is confirmed, the case will go into the category of civil, and the situation will be resolved. I was wrong. It took them two weeks to find the missing funds. By that time, the company was in very serious trouble. His loan was completely closed by the banks, and an infusion of new capital will be required to resume it. Gloria showed up late on Friday night with both of our suitcases from the trip. Her key didn't work because I changed the locks. I met her at the door. She didn't look very well. Please take it. Can you help? Gloria asked in a pleading voice. Please let me come in. If not for my sake, then think about the children, Gloria begged. No, you can't come in. You don't live here anymore. I left your car parked on the street. I think you still have the keys. I replied. Do you really hate me that much? What is it exactly? She asked. Yes, I replied firmly and closed the door. I made the decision that she should stay with her parents. I instructed Felix to serve her with a restraining order and begin divorce proceedings. The little respite provided by the bridge proved to be extremely useful to me. Felix forbade her to come near me, and I got temporary custody of the children. It took her two months and probably all the money she could muster to adjust to the situation. By that time, the divorce process was already in full swing, and we just had to clarify the details. Unfortunately, Gabe wasn't so lucky. Countryman Real Estate was forced to close and ceased operations immediately after Labor Day. The following week, I was surprised to see a visitor in my office. When I entered the office after completing the third transaction of the day, I found a man sitting in a visitor's chair. He had a tanned complexion and seemed to be in good health, and he was dressed casually, as if for a northern autumn. Bernie, how are you? I greeted him. I'm fine, he replied, looking around my modest office. Sensing that his visit was not a coincidence, I asked, What brings you to the cool north? 
Well, here's the thing, he began. Florida is teeming with sharks, and, oddly enough, not all of them are found in the water. I decided to go back to my roots, he admitted. I'm glad you're back, I replied, not knowing what he wanted to hear in response. Bernie saw the question in my eyes. I have invested a significant amount of money there. Everything went back to normal for me, but it seems like I was just lucky, he said, and a hint of a smile appeared on his face. This business that I owned seems to be within reach, Bernie added. I looked at him and smiled back, and our laughter died down. So what are you asking me, old pirate? I asked. He answered directly. I need a partner. Because of my age, bankers are skeptical about my ability to do business alone. But with you, we could make a formidable team. What do you say? Bernie asked. I hesitated and confessed. I don't have much money, especially considering my impending divorce. He nodded understandingly, leaving me wondering how much he knew about my personal affairs. The news spread quickly. Maybe I'll give you 10%, Bernie suggested. I can invest 50%, I said. Come on, you just said you don't have any money, Bernie said incredulously. I bet you have them, I said. Okay, I'll settle for 45%. I offered. No, 25% is reasonable, but it's not enough, he countered. How about 40% and an option to buy other 10% in 10 years? I suggested. Okay, but I hope I live long enough to see this, said the man who I knew would be attending my funeral. Bernie and I are back in the business world. We managed to purchase all the plots owned by countrymen at a reduced price from banks, which, in fact, used the money of the same bank to store them. Despite initial concerns, we quickly established a successful home construction and sale business. Meanwhile, life went on, including my divorce proceedings, which mostly boiled down to a dispute over custody of the children and their visitation. In the end, we reached a detailed agreement on joint custody and visits. That's why, when I returned home on Christmas Eve, I found the house dark and empty. As a result, Gloria took the children away for Christmas, even though I should have had them. The children were already getting tired of this routine. As I approached the house, I noticed a figure sitting on the steps, sheltering from the cold and light snow. It wasn't until I got closer that I realized it was my ex-wife, Gloria. She didn't look well. Gloria, what are you doing here? I asked, worried. She looked even thinner than the last time we met, and her eyes seemed empty and indifferent. It was obvious that she had shed tears recently. I want to go home, she complained. Where are the children? I asked, ignoring her request. They're with my parents. They want to go home, too. We want to become a family again in our cozy home. What you put us through was unfair, Gloria said. I didn't intentionally harm our entire family. I replied coldly. Well, yes, it is. I made a mistake, Gloria admitted. I admit that it was an annoying and hurtful mistake, but it was just one mistake. You destroyed our family, Gloria said with anger in her voice. She was trying to control her emotions, making a conscious effort to stay calm. I promised myself not to let anger get the better of me, but I can't help myself. This situation takes me to the worst level, she admitted. I was amazed. Do you have anger issues? I asked. Don't act like it's not your fault. You're not like that. Did you think you could get away with anything? I'm not naive, Lyle. You've never been perfect, Gloria said. I admit that I hurt you, but it was not my intention to hurt you. Did you honestly believe that watching you make love to another man wouldn't hurt me? I asked. She turned away clearly hurt by my words. I watched her wipe away her tears with her back to me. It was obvious that she was crying. I've always been the one who was overlooked, the one who stayed away from the fun, always waiting for someone to ask me to dance. I was a good girl who never caused problems, she began. I spent a lot of time defending myself from rude attacks. Throughout high school and most of college, I patiently waited for the right person to appear in my life. When I finally met you, 
I realized that you were the person I was looking for. When we tied the knot, I was immaculate, although I didn't make a fuss about it, assuming that you already knew everything. You weren't a prince then, and you certainly aren't now. You were an ordinary guy, but I loved you with all my heart. Maybe you were a little smarter and more purposeful than others, but that's what made me admire you even more, Gloria said. We were constantly experiencing financial difficulties, but I put up with it out of love for you. It was very painful for me to watch you go through difficulties. But then Gabriel showed up, and everything suddenly got better. He had all the qualities a woman could want in a man. For once it seemed to me that Prince Charming was interested in me. His attention was flattering, especially after the Christmas party when he started calling me regularly. It was a light flirtation, something that beautiful women are used to experiencing, says Gloria. Guys paid attention to me, but not people from rich and influential circles. Gabe kept telling me how lucky I was to have a great boyfriend like you, Gloria said. Gabe must really adore me, I grumbled. That's right. He mentioned your dedication and expressed his desire to express appreciation for your efforts. I understood what he was getting at. If I treat him well, he'll take care of you. I guess I let him convince me that you would only benefit if I fulfilled his wishes, Gloria said sadly. And all this is true, as is my desire to possess him. There seemed to be a chaotic voice in my mind that was pulling me towards him. I was torn between wanting something to happen this weekend and simultaneously being afraid. But as soon as we arrived, my resistance began to weaken, Gloria said. Yes, I remember our conversation in the kitchen in the cabin in the mountains, but I did not think that you would carry it out. I spoke. You understood everything without my words, but you didn't mind. I thought you didn't mind, she muttered, looking into my eyes, tears streaming down her face and water running from her nose. I trusted you. That night you ruined our 16-year marriage. How could you betray me like that? I asked, feeling hurt. But we loved each other anyway. It was just a brief moment. He is nothing compared to the love we shared before and the love we will share in the future, Gloria said. Are you so deluded that you think that just because he was able to make you scream with pleasure, we can get everything we want? Come on, you can't be that naive, I said in shock. It was all a facade. I wanted to please him. I put on a show for him. Some people crave and demand it, but you should know that after 16 years of intimacy with me, I'm not like that in bed at all, Gloria said. I only know what you did, how you disgraced me. You chose a charming guy over me, an egoist who gives nothing and takes everything, I said coldly. Do you think Gabe is incredibly strong? And where is he now? What happened during the crisis? I'll tell you everything in detail, I said, clenching my hands into fists. Our society is organized in such a way that it supports the power of the elect based on the idea of the hidden genius that they supposedly possess. Explain to me, how did this supposed genius come down the mountain at such a speed? I asked. He just called a helicopter. By this point, he had already guessed that you had intervened in this case. It was quite obvious that you had severed ties. He suspected you of embezzling his funds, Gloria said. The group started to panic. Paula categorically rejected the idea that the bridge had burned down, saying that it was impossible. When the helicopter finally arrived, there was only room for Gabe, and the rest were left behind. Some of them have lost hope. Fortunately, the National Guard intervened and set up a temporary bridge to save us. Sharon and her husband reconciled, although the wife was already aware of the situation. She was in the same position as me. Unfortunately, Robin's fiancé broke off their engagement. Both Glenn and Ken got into trouble, but with Paula's help, they managed to get out of it, Gloria said. I think Gabe and we, ordinary people, suffered the most. But weren't these sufferings already unbearable? She asked, and her eyes searched for confidence in mine. There was a lot of truth in Gloria's words. I couldn't deny my involvement. I worked for Gabe, but I didn't join him like everyone else. I was aware of reality, but I preferred to ignore it. It's hard for me to come to terms with the events that have happened. 
They were filled with empty promises hiding a trap if you look closely. Despite the fact that no one pays attention to it, the attractiveness of the illusion outweighs the severity of reality. We went through difficult moments, which eventually came to naught. But what you and Gabe have stolen from me is a sense of security in my own home. This loss is irreparable because it destroyed my faith in what I cherished. Our connection was just a mirage, I said painfully. With these words, I got up from my seat and headed for the exit of the dim and deserted monastery. But she remained adamant. Tell me, would you rather be alone than be with me? Gloria asked. Would you rather be with me and our children at the Christmas tree tonight? Gloria looked at me pleadingly. I looked at her, tempted to hug her, express my love to her, take our children home to sleep in their beds on Christmas Eve and act as if nothing had happened. But I couldn't give an answer and turned away from her. The past cannot be changed and we must focus on our future.